sea turtles are one of the most beloved of all creatures. Graceful flyers, gently gliding through the ocean currents. Driving down the beach on an ATV, it looks like fun, but this is all business. Think of the sand as a giant laboratory. The subject, sea turtles, large and small. Why they're choosing to live here. The unique way South Florida's climate affects their gender. And some of their biggest threats from both people and nature. South Florida is known for its beautiful beaches, its clear blue water, and plenty of sunshine. It's also home to some pretty amazing creatures, endangered sea turtles. Hi, I'm Kate Wentley. Join us as we explore the life cycle, the challenges, and triumphs of this endangered species. This nine and a half mile stretch of coastline is the prime nesting ground for three different species of them. In fact, this area is considered the most densely nested site in the world for loggerhead sea turtles. It's also one of the most popular nesting sites for several other species as well. Three species that primarily nest on our beaches. We have the leatherback sea turtle, which arrives first, usually in around March. We have the loggerhead sea turtle, which is kind of our most common turtle that we have here in Florida. And they come second, usually we'll get some nests maybe in April and they kind of peak in June and July. And then we also have green turtles that nest very frequently here as well. And they're kind of the latest to arrive um, and bring us through the end of the season. We'll also occasionally get um, a rare hawksbill or a Kemp's Ridley turtle that will nest in Florida as those are commonly in our waters. But as far as nesting, it's those, those two species are very rare. The hawksbill turtle, while an infrequent guest on land, is a common visitor to the local reefs, which offer a fine meal for the endangered reptile. So what makes this particular part of our coast so attractive to sea turtles? Perhaps it's not one thing, but many. This stretch of beach seems to have the perfect conditions that the turtles need for nesting, and, and that's a combination of a lot of different factors, not a single factor. But the quality of the sand, the temperature, the currents going past the area, the fact that the Gulf Stream is so close to the beach, uh, all of these things kind of play into it and uh, make this narrow, short stretch of beach extremely popular with the turtles for, for nesting purposes. This nest was laid by a loggerhead sea turtle. Sarah Hirsch monitors these beaches as data manager for Loggerhead Marine Life Center. She records when and where the nests are laid and which species of turtle is responsible. Most often, she doesn't actually see the mother turtle, but there are some telltale signs. This may look like ordinary sand, but to those in the know, this sand and the delicate patterns in it hold many clues as to exactly what kind of turtle made these tracks. Each of the different species kind of crawls in a different pattern. So the loggerhead sea turtles, they crawl with an alternating gait. That means they're moving their flippers kind of one at a time. So we can see that in the sand. So that's what we noted in this case. Uh, the green sea turtles actually crawl with the simultaneous gait. So they're crawling with both flippers kind of coming up the beach at the same time. And that leaves a different pattern in the sand that we're looking for. We also have leatherbacks that nest on our beaches. Those tracks are very easy to see because they are huge. You cannot straddle a leatherback nest. That's how you know you have one. Um, their tracks are, are six feet wide and so they're bigger than I am. Um, so that's how we can determine what species of turtle laid the nest. We document that information on the date that the nest was laid. And then we can mark that nest with a stake. This uh, stake lets us know that there's a nest in front of it and we're going to look at that area every single day while the nest is incubating. So again, for about 55 days until this nest hatches, we're gonna check on it every single day, make sure that predators aren't getting into it. We're gonna note if anything happens, if 
the surf comes up over the nest. That's important information for us to collect. Um, so we're going to note all of that during that incubation period. And then once we notice the nest is hatched, we'll dig down and do our inventory of the nest. An inventory of the nest is logged and analyzed to show trends and reveal secrets previously unknown about this popular but elusive marine mammal. That information helps scientists understand the health of the turtle population, the health of the ocean, and other significant data, including nesting preferences. Turtles usually will nest in or around the same areas from which they were hatched. Now that's not always true, but what we oftentimes find is, so the leatherbacks kind of during the nesting season are the most widest migrators, so they might nest 100 kilometers north of their first clutch or 100 kilometers south, but generally they're, you know, if they nest in Florida, they're going to remain in Florida. The other species tend to be a little bit more site specific or have fidelity is what we call it and will return to their what we call their natal beaches for the most part that's not always 100% true but we do have evidence of on our beaches here of mothers and sisters and daughters um, of some species on our beach. Loggerhead Marine Life Center's research biologists monitor 9.5 miles of some of the world's most densely populated stretches of beach for sea turtles so we monitor from the northern Palm Beach County line south to the northern line of John D. MacArthur Beach State Park. Researchers riding ATVs scour the coastline in the morning and again at night. So what specifically are they looking for? Find out just ahead. Plus, learn ways you can help. heats up the sand, providing a natural incubator for sea turtle eggs, which take anywhere from 45 to 80 days to hatch, depending on the species of the turtle. Sea turtles typically hatch out at night. That includes these baby leatherbacks, which we came across during one of our late night walks with the biologists. Sea turtles, when they hatch, the little hatchlings uh, orient themselves towards the brightest light on the horizon. Naturally, that would be the moon. Um, however, uh, with, of course, the buildup of coastal communities, with all of us also enjoying the beach, there is light pollution. So during nesting season uh, at Loggerhead, we encourage people to turn down your lights or dim your lights with sea turtle safe lighting, which helps the hatchlings and, of course, the nesting females as well to not get um, as disoriented when they're nesting or when they're hatching and they can orient themselves towards the ocean where they should be. You've probably heard the slogan lights out for sea turtles. It's one of many rules aimed at protecting these endangered species. Signs like this one remind people to avoid females as they come ashore to nest as well as the nests they leave behind. Now once those eggs hatch it's time for the pros to excavate and find out exactly how successful those nests really are. So we actually have two different ways that we make sure we know exactly where this nest is. First of all, we take a sub-meter GPS point of all of our crawls on the beach so that we can get back to this location if for whatever reason we lose the nest stake. We also have a backup nest stake that's left in the dunes and we have measurements to that stake. So we have a compass bearing and a uh, measured distance to that backup stake that's in the dunes and that can get us back to this same location as well. So how do experts know where to look and what to look for? The way we kind of survey in the morning, our first run down the beach, we're looking for all the new adult tracks that are left in the sand. So we're driving down the beach, we're looking for again, it kind of looks like almost tire tracks coming up the beach. So we're looking for those, documenting all of that. And then as we're riding back down the beach on our way back to the office, we're checking on all of the existing nests. So we have a great sheet of paper that prints out a list of all of our nests that we have on the beach and we're checking off 
each of those nests and making sure that we're monitoring those sites every single day. We put tape in the egg chamber and then we put a stake behind the clutch and that is so that the morning crew who does all of the marking and, and GPS coordinates knows that that nest is special. We have sampled that mom and we want to make sure that we get uh, eggs and hatchlings from that female. So they'll remove our stake, take a GPS coordinate that's very accurate and then replace it with a stake and give the nest a special ID. It's not only important that researchers learn how healthy the nests are, they are also studying the mother turtles to learn how often they come ashore to nest. We've done a lot of previous studies um, and a lot of different organizations have, have done studies to figure out how many nests these females are laying in a season. So one of the ways we can do that is by putting a satellite transmitter on the back of a turtle. So if we can encounter that female at the very beginning of the season and put a satellite transmitter on her, we can actually follow her movements throughout the nesting season. And through those studies, we've uh, figured out that sea turtles come back three to seven times in a season to lay nests. They come back about every 10 days to 14 days to lay a new clutch of eggs. When you see a nesting turtle on the beach, you should never approach it. They are protected, uh, both federally and locally in our state, and so approaching a turtle is never a good thing because you could scare them. So if you do see a nesting turtle, you should only use red lights, and you should stay maybe 10 to 20 feet back to make sure that you don't disturb her, and also stay behind her. If she sees you, you can oftentimes spook them, and then they'll leave and they won't lay their eggs. Um, so when we, what you saw on camera is when we were sampling, turtles undergo what we call this trance and what happens is their fight or flight hormone that many of us are familiar with is really decreased during the egg laying process and so they don't have that trigger in their head that says to get out. So they don't have kind of that fear that might happen if they're being chased by a predator. And so that's usually when we collect our samples is when the turtle's laying eggs is because they are undergoing that, that trance. Once she finishes laying her eggs, the turtle comes out of the trance and heads back to the ocean. The turtle's every move noticed by researchers. We use science every day by collecting data. We use technology to enter our data into the, the computer. Engineering is important, obviously, for a lot of the equipment that we use, and mathematical modeling is used all the time in the field of, of sea turtle biology. And you know, other important things is, is you know, just general reading and writing. We read and we write intensely every single day in this field, so those are really important things to, to be good at as well. Learning science, technology, engineering, and math is helpful. So too is learning a few simple ways you can help clear the path of adult turtles and hatchlings alike. Simple things that kids can do, anybody really can do to protect nesting sea turtles and the hatchlings is, you know, pick up trash if you're on the beach. If you build a sand castle, that's great. Just make sure to knock it down when you're done because those can become a barrier for sea turtle hatchlings. So if they're trying to make their way to the ocean and they can't get past your sand castle, that can be a problem. So make sure to do that. And then of course, uh, if you see any holes, be sure to fill those in on the beach. Those can also obstruct. So those are just a few things you can do. With a tough shell and a sharp beak, you may think sea turtles are pretty safe, but are they? Just ahead, a look at some of the biggest threats they face from people and nature. Plus, is it a boy or a girl? Find out how the gender of these turtles is determined long after the eggs are laid. Adult sea turtles have a hard outer shell for protection, but that's not the case for these little guys. That's part of the reason why they're so vulnerable. Experts put their chances of survival at one in a thousand. Some even say it's one in 10,000. The threats coming on both land and at sea. Anything that has a mouth bigger than the hatchling, so hatchlings kind of fit in the palm of your hand, and anything that has a mouth bigger than that is going to eat the hatchling. So we have birds that are out here that will feed on the hatchlings, raccoons, coyotes, 
Armadillos even will dig into nests and eat the eggs and sometimes the hatchlings. Um, and then once they get out to sea, they also have to contend with predators like fish, sharks, again, anything that has a mouth big enough to swallow a hatchling. So they've got a tricky life ahead of them. People, even some with the best intentions, also threaten the health and survival of sea turtles. We see human interaction causes uh, with some frequency. Uh, they're caught by fishermen on fishing uh, hook and line, or they may be entangled in fishing gear that was discarded by fishermen. Uh, so, and then we do see some uh, specific diseases. Uh, one in particular that we call chronic debilitation uh, is a f causes uh, about 25% of our cases uh, that, that we deal with here. Boat strikes are a very common issue. Unfortunately, the mortality rate is very high in the, in the boat strikes, and most of those don't survive. Uh, but we're able to save some of those. Uh, we see shark bites, uh, which is natural uh, causes for, for these turtles. Uh, we, we see a variety of things, but there are, are several of the things that occur more frequently than others. The Loggerhead Marine Life Center specializes in rescuing and rehabilitating turtles that need a special brand of care. We take in sick and injured sea turtles uh, from all around the area as well as from other areas from other states sometimes uh, to try to make them healthy and return them back to the wild. Uh, along the way we try to learn as much as we can possibly learn from each case uh, because there's uh, not a whole lot known about the sea turtles and, and all the diseases that they have and things like that. So we want to learn about it every step of the way. Scientists are also developing state-of-the-art treatment methods and sharing information with wildlife organizations across the globe. Work on determining the best treatment options for many of these cases and in, in some cases this turns out to be something that is beneficial uh, not just to sea turtles but to other species. One case in point is that we started using uh, what's called parenteral nutrition. It's basically feeding the turtles intravenously uh, for the turtles that are sick and their intestines aren't working and so forth. And uh, we found a way to be able to do that with sea turtles. Uh, it's already done in humans and some other animals, but it had to be done a special way uh, with sea turtles because they live in the water. And uh, that information has now been uh, disseminated. I've done presentations in uh, Argentina and in Australia relating to that, and now there are people all around the world. I just had an email from China uh, a week or so ago from a, a veterinarian asking questions relating to how to use parental nutrition uh, there. And I know in South America it's being used in, in penguins as well. So uh, we're, we're looking to help all the animals, uh, all the sea turtles of the world, as well as any other animals we can help along the way. Sea turtle nests may have a sign like this one nearby. It reminds people that it is against the law to disturb or touch a sea turtle or its nest. Turtles are protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act of 1973. Storms are also a big factor. We just had a hurricane form off, you know, close to Africa that we'll be monitoring closely. And if that does bring in some pretty inclement weather, we can see a lot of nests that get washed out because as the water comes very high on the beach, the eggs can become exposed and will roll around. And once that kind of happens, the embryos are no longer viable, so they're, you know, they're, they're really sub subject to a number of, of factors. The climate in South Florida is a big factor in determining if the sea turtle hatchlings will be male or female. Many reptiles have what we call temperature-dependent sex determination, where the temperature of the nest that they were incubated in determines the sex of the offspring. So they don't have sex chromosomes like mammals do, like you and I. 
And so what happens is usually in turtles, what we say is hot girls, cool guys is kind of an easy way to remember it. And that's not true for all reptiles, but so we say hot girls, cool guys. So warmer nests tend to produce females and cooler nests will tend to produce males. And so here in Florida, because it is very warm, we do see a very high female bias in the hatchlings that we have on our beaches. Generally, the, the bottom of the nest is, is cooler, it's closer to the water table, and so you might get some males that are produced in the bottom and females that might be produced near the top or in the middle where there's a lot of heat. Last year, we did note that we had a very hot and dry summer, and that led to a decrease in the hatch and emergence success for our nest. It was actually a drop of uh, 10 to 20 percent, which was a little discouraging. Um, it's likely a cause of the global climate change that's occurring. And so we're not sure how the turtles are going to adapt to those issues. We're not sure if they're going to move further north where it's not as hot as it is down here, or they could shift their nesting season to earlier or later to avoid the hottest months. Um, or we could have years like this year where we've had a little bit more rain, which kind of tempers the, the sand temperatures and allows for better hatch success of the nests. So this is very encouraging for us to see. Factors which can have a lasting impact on the local sea turtle population. You could call sea turtles ancient mariners. They've been around for millions of years. Still, many questions remain. Questions about their health, growth, population, and their habits. Loggerhead Marine Life Center has one of the longest running data sets in the world. And it's very important for us to have those long-term data sets that, so that we can analyze the trends that are occurring in these populations. Sea turtles are a long-lived species. They don't mature until they're about 25 years old. So we don't see a whole generation until we've studied them for 25 years. So these long-term data sets are crucial. That's why biologists here in northern Palm Beach County scour the beaches, tracking nests and hatchlings. They're also tracking adult turtles and drawing blood from them. It's part of a long-term research project aimed at learning about the turtles that call Palm Beach County home. We're primarily out there tagging, sampling, and um, we do ultrasound of these animals as well. So what you guys got footage of um, is the, the taking blood. So the reason why we do that is we are doing a maternal viral transfer study, so to see if um, nesting females that might have a certain disease if they pass that on to their offspring. So that's what the blood was for. We also take skin samples for genetics. Um, so we look at the genetics of the mother and how the population might be related to one another and then how many fathers there are in that female's egg chamber or, or her clutch of eggs. So some green turtles can have four or five or six fathers in a single nest. Ultrasound that we did was to measure fat depth in those animals, so we take the ultrasound in the shoulder and we can see how deep her layer of fat is in that area and how that changes across the nesting season. And then lastly, what you guys saw is us putting on tags and measuring the animals. So the measuring is kind of a standard thing that's done throughout the whole world. We can see how uh, size changes through time. We can look at growth rates as a result of that and turtles that we might see again in a different season. And the tags are really important if a turtle strands somewhere or if it comes back or nests somewhere else, we can identify that animal when she nested and when she was originally tagged and where. But once we've collected all of those samples, we bring them back here. We process them for the health analytes. We'll store a lot of them in the freezer and some of them get analyzed you know, immediately. So it's a very long process to do any type of research project. It can be months and even, even years before you get everything that you want. Researchers are also trying to uncover potential diseases the turtles may pass on to their babies. We take blood from the hatchlings as well to determine, we're looking at health in the hatchlings as well as if they have this disease presence. So we're not 
only there at night looking for the nesting females, we're also there looking for <laughs> the daughters and the sons of those females as well. And the morning crew will look for that too. They'll, they usually don't see many emergences in the morning, but they will look for tracks. And if they come from a marked nest, they will document that so they know to ex excavate that soon. Information that helps create a clear picture of the health of these individual species and for sea turtles as a whole. It also helps experts discover new details about the species' nesting habits and why, for instance, many return to lay their own eggs on the stretch of beach where they were born. A microchip into your dog or cat so that you can identify them specifically. We do the same with our sea turtles. We put in a pit tag. It takes a little bit more work because you have to have a scanner to actually locate that tag, but it's a more permanent tag. Um, and so over the years with researchers being out at night and tagging these females, we've been able to learn a lot about their nesting patterns, where they're coming back, when they're coming back to lay their nests every year. We have evidence of on our beaches here of mothers and sisters and daughters um, of some species on our beach. I actually had turtles this year that came up that we haven't seen in about 10 years that were tag tagged in some of the original parts of the project. So part of it is kind of population monitoring, seeing who is here, who comes back, who doesn't come back. Then there are those rare occasions when everyone gets a welcome surprise. It just kind of made you go wow when, in terms of the trackers? Well, right now we're tracking a turtle actively. It's uh, available online. The turtle's name was Burt Reynolds. This was uh, an olive ridley, which does not normally occur in Florida waters, but it's stranded here. Uh, it's only the fifth one to ever strand in the state of Florida. Uh, but because it is very much out of habitat, not where it normally lives, we wanted to determine you know, where it goes back to, where its home really was. Because this species generally lives down off the coast of South America or in the Caribbean. And so we're tracking that turtle and it hasn't been long enough to know exactly where it's going to go. Uh, but uh, we're, we're excited to see where it eventually ends up. There's no question sea turtles are a treasured site here in South Florida, leading some people to ask if there's more that we can do to safeguard these precious creatures. The answer is yes. The simple things that you can do and the measures local businesses are taking to help protect these animals. are a telltale sign of what's going on on our planet. The oceans and our beaches are littered with dangerous debris, especially plastic. So one of the biggest threats to our sea turtles is actually humans and the impacts that we're causing. And this right here is a great example. Single-use plastic, including plastic straws, are very destructive to our environment and actually harm our sea turtle population. We had over 600 hatchlings that came into our hospital last year and every single one of those hatchlings and post hatchlings had plastics in their gut. So the single most important thing that people can do on an everyday basis to help our sea turtle population is to make sure they're reducing their use of single use plastic, especially straws. Just say no to straws when you go to the restaurant, tell the waiter that you don't need a straw, and you can help save sea turtles by that one simple act. Many restaurants are no longer offering straws, opting to protect sea turtles from the threat of microplastics or tiny pieces that result when the plastic breaks down. These small pieces often end up in the ocean, adding to the problem of pollution. It's easy for a sea turtle to mistake a plastic bag or a deflated balloon for a jellyfish, which they love to eat. Sea turtles eat a number of different things and it depends on the animal that you're talking about. So leatherback turtles eat jellyfish, so they can eat up to 
a thousand pounds of jellyfish in a single day and that's the primary source of their diet so they're really really what we call specialists they forage mostly on these kind of gelatinous animals um, green turtles are herbivorous meaning that they eat the plants um, as adults and so the reason why they get their name is they eat so many plants that it turns their fat kind of a yellowish green color and so that and due to the the vegetation and loggerheads eat kind of hard shelled species so like crabs um, lobsters snails things like that so they have really powerful jaws that help them specialize on that and some of the other cool species uh, the hawksbill sea turtle actually eats sponges and coral as the primary portion of its diet sea turtles are often spotted floating on top of the ocean but they can quickly dive to avoid boaters and curious onlookers. A turtle can hold its breath for a very long time and it depends on how active the turtle is. So if the turtle is kind of resting on the bottom, it can hold its breath for hours. And if the turtle is very active in swimming, it might only hold its breath for maybe five to 15 minutes. And it's very similar to us in a pool. So if you try to hold your breath in a pool and if you just float at the surface, you can hold your breath a lot longer than if you're actively swimming. So it, you know, it's very similar among the species. They're just much better at holding their breath than we are. Interesting facts about a fascinating reptile. The mission of Loggerhead Marine Life Center is to promote the conservation of ocean ecosystems with a special focus on threatened and endangered sea turtles. So what does it take to make a career out of working along the beach with animals you love? The veterinary career is, is an interesting career because there are many different avenues uh, that, that people can pursue. Uh, the normal traditional ones of dog and cat or horse and cow veterinarian uh, are certainly there, but there are a lot of other ones. There are wildlife veterinarians, there are aquatic veterinarians such as myself. Uh, there are a lot of different avenues that can be pursued. Uh, research can be a big part of it as well. Uh, so there's many different options, uh, not just to, to be the normal, typical dog and cat vet. So if you're thinking about a career in marine biology, I would say to get it involved as early as you can. We have high school internships that are available and internships and even jobs, seasonal jobs that are available all throughout uh, your college career as well. And those are very important early steps in getting your feet in the door for, for really getting a career going in this field. What I like best is, is being able to help these animals that uh, would have died had we not intervened and, and helped them out. Uh, it's a very rewarding thing uh, to be able to release them back into the wild when, uh, when their uh, destiny didn't look like that was going to be a part of it is, is what is, is most satisfying for me. Sea turtles are treasured neighbors along Florida's coastline and like all living creatures, they play a vital role in our ecosystem.